What's up folks, Exo Paradigm Gamer here, and much like the 1996 animated film, we're back! And yeah, it's been a while and I apologize for that, but if you guys want to know more about what the hell's been going on, I've published like two or three update videos that are very detailed on the situation, so go watch those if you're interested. That being said, last time we met we talked about Super Mario 64 and Super Mario 64 DS, uh, it was a video that was requested for a long time, and it's good to have it off my plate. The meme is dead. Um, and since I've given that in-depth treatment to Super Mario 64, I'd like to do the same for the game's follow-up, Super Mario Sunshine on the Nintendo GameCube. And this game's kind of divisive, I guess. Some people just absolutely love this game, other people are like, it was alright. And there are other people who are like, this game fucking sucks. And I'm not even going to pretend to know what the consensus is, because every time I do, people are like, that's not the consensus. So, I, I think, though, it's still safe to say that this is probably usually not considered one of the best Mario games. And for that reason alone, and many others, I guess, I'd like to examine this game in depth and see whether any of the criticisms hold water. So, without further ado, let's jump right in. After the release of the, at the time, beloved Super Mario 64, the Mario series dove headfirst into the realm of spin-offs. This is where games like the Mario Party series, the sports games, and the first Paper Mario game came into being. There was originally going to be a direct sequel to Super Mario 64 on the Japanese-only Nintendo 64 disc drive, tentatively titled Super Mario 64 2, which would offer cooperative multiplayer and introduce Luigi as a playable character. As you probably know, the Nintendo 64 DD failed harder than the Wii U, so the game was cancelled early in development. It's possible that ideas from the cancelled prototype were incorporated into future 3D Mario releases. A true follow-up to Super Mario 64 would have to wait for the release of Super Mario Sunshine on the Nintendo GameCube in 2002. Development began in late 2000, early 2001, when someone floated the idea of a game centering around a water pump. The game received only about a year and a half of development time, with key figures in the game's development admitting that the game was rushed and that that content was cut. Nevertheless, the game was released to universal critical acclaim and was considered another laudable Mario classic. Over the next few years, however, popular opinion quickly shifted through a public conversation that I always imagined went something like this. Boy, Mario sure is amazing. Every game Nintendo puts out is great. Yeah, even Sunshine was pretty good. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the game was kind of weird. Now that you mention it, I didn't really like the Pachinko Shine sprite. And what's with all those weird enemies? And those blue coins! Ugh, what a hassle it was to collect them all. Yeah, and all you get is a postcard. You know, now that I think about it, while most Mario games are really good, Sunshine is one of the weaker ones. Yeah, kind of a disappointment after Super Mario 64. You gotta remember that the early 2000s were a different time for the Mario franchise. This was back when mainstream releases were fewer and farther between, and before Nintendo released four separate new Super Mario Bros. games. So it makes sense that Sunshine would receive acclaim despite its troubled development cycle. Given time, however, people started to notice things they didn't before, and I'm sure there were many people who never liked the game to begin with. Again, I don't really know what the consensus is, but I think I can say with relative certainty that most people prefer for 64, the Galaxy games, and 3D Land slash 3D World. As for me, Super Mario Sunshine was a huge part of my childhood, but even back then, there were a lot of things that bothered me. I thought all the enemies were really weird, I didn't like how few levels there were, and getting 100% seemed vastly out of reach at the time. Back then, I preferred Mario 64, and in 2004, the DS remake then overshadowed both games. Now, after the release of the groundbreaking Galaxy games, it's safe to say that for all of Sunshine's attempts to experiment with the series, very little of that stuck around going forward. I've since played through Super Mario Sunshine 7 or 8 times to full completion, and yeah, my opinions changed quite a bit on this one. And seeing as I gave Super Mario 64 such an in-depth treatment in the previous video, I'd like to do the same for Super Mario Sunshine to see whether any of the criticisms you hear around the internet are meritorious or not. Without further ado, this is my review of Super Mario Sunshine. The story is something else. Ooh, look at that! 
it starts out strikingly similar to Super Mario World. Mario and Princess Peach once again head off for a much needed vacation, joined this time by the overprotective Toadsworth, making his debut in this game. Their destination? Isle Delfino, a tropical resort where the sun shines 24 hours a day, except in Pianta Village for some reason. As they come in for a landing, they discover the airstrip is covered in some sort of icky paint-like goop. Now, now boys, don't touch that stuff. Toadsworth asks Mario to sort things out, who then uncovers a water pack named Flood, a Flash Liquidizer Ultra Dowsing device. The pump registers Mario as his owner and agrees to help him clean up the sludge. After defeating a polluted piranha, Mario is arrested by law enforcement and taken to trial. There, the prosecution claims that someone in Mario's likeness has been covering the island in goop, scaring away the island's guardians, the shine sprites, and plunging the island into darkness. His only evidence? A police composite sketch. The truth is obvious. The guilty party sits among us. It is none other than Mario. Objection! The prosecution's case is specious at best and rests entirely on hearsay, which is forbidden under Delfino Rules of Evidence 802. The opposing counsel claims to have eyewitnesses, but has declined to call them to the stand so that my client may cross-examine them pursuant to the Confrontation Clause of the Delfino Constitution. And opposing counsel has not shown that his hearsay witnesses are unavailable under the exceptions listed in Rule 804A of the Rules of Evidence. To convict my client also requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt, and in light of the opposing counsel's lack of evidence, I move for summary judgment in favor of my client. Overruled! I judge the defendant guilty as charged. I hereby order the defendant to clean this entire island. Until Isle Delfino is completely free of his vile handiwork, Mario shall not be allowed to leave. Court adjourned! After that travesty of criminal justice, Mario is sentenced with cleaning up an entire island by himself. Well, it's better than jail time, I guess. Shortly after beginning his sentence, Mario discovers that a shadowy doppelganger known as Shadow Mario with his magic paintbrush is responsible for the island's graffiti. Shadow Mario attempts to kidnap the princess, but Mario manages to chase him off and follows him through a magic gateway. And so begins Mario's quest to clean Isle Delfino from top to bottom. Along the way, Mario will have to collect shine sprites, which will bring back peace and sunshine to the island. That's the basic setup for Super Mario Sunshine, but there are a couple of twists. Ah, oh, spoiler alert! Around the quarter mark, Shadow Mario returns and absconds with Princess Peach to Penis Park, with Mario shooting himself out of a cannon to give chase. After a face-off against Shadow Mario's mech, Shadow Mario reveals himself to be none other than Bowser Jr., who is under the delusion that Peach is his mother, somehow? Even more concerning is that Peach can't seem to remember if this is true or not. As my brother Eric once said, Didn't she remember having a slimy Koopa baby come out of her vagina? <laughs> By the way, remember how Bowser had seven Koopalings in the classics? Well, fuck them! Those aren't Bowser's real kids anymore! So declares Lord Miyamoto from the mountaintop. Anyways, Bowser Jr. reveals that his plan was to frame Mario for his crime so that he could make up with the princess while Mario rotted in jail. Which is probably Bowser's smartest evil plot to date. Bowser Jr. then escapes with Princess Peach to Corona Mountain. After chasing down Shadow Mario across the island, Mario finally gains access to Corona Mountain and makes his way to... Bowser's evil hot tub in the sky. What follows is Bowser's first and only official speaking role. <laughs> the water's great, hey Junior? Mario, how dare you disturb my family vacation? <laughs> It's laughable, to say the least. After Mario defeats Bowser and recovers the final shine sprite, Bowser and his son float away from the island. Bowser Jr. then admits he knew Peach wasn't his mother the whole time, but pledges to keep helping his dad anyway. Then what was the point of introducing this whole maternity plot point to begin with? Flood also dies, but it gets fixed right away, so yeah. Overall, this plot is a strange mix of both incredibly silly and surprisingly intelligent plot points, with a decent presentation and goofy voice acting, and I absolutely love it to pieces. I'll admit that I like it mostly in an ironic way, and I wouldn't exactly want this to become a new standard for main series storytelling, but it's such a fun change of pace from the usual Mario plotline and so damn endearing that I can't help but enjoy it anyway. This is the only official Mario game to feature voice acted cutscenes, and... Yeah, these aren't exactly top-tier performances, but at 
the same time, I find them immensely enjoyable in an ironic way. This script is unforgettably quotable from start to finish. Go straight that way. You can't miss the mess, pal. Your first job's to get rid of all that ugliness. And remember, we'll be watching you, pal. We'll know if you start slacking off. The good news is that if you don't like the plot, there's not a whole lot of it past the beginning. So if this handful of cutscenes ruins this Mario game for you, I challenge you to evaluate your priorities. At the very least, the plot gives an adequate justification for why you're collecting shine sprites, so it doesn't feel like mindless busy work. And for that, I say it does its job. Moving on to visuals, by Hylia is this a gorgeous game for its time. Compared to Super Mario 64, which was a decent looking launch title with a few ugly character models, Super Mario Sunshine is one of the best looking games of the generation despite being released early in the GameCube's life cycle. All of the character models look great, the texture work holds up remarkably well, and everything is just overall pleasant on the eye. Part of what makes the visuals hold up so well is that, unlike many PS2 classics, Super Mario Sunshine supports progressive scan. Thus, while Super Mario Sunshine still looks great on a CRT to this day, it looks even better on a modern one with the right cables, meaning the visuals have aged like fine wine. Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the art direction. Super Mario Sunshine goes for a tropical island theme, with levels taking place in a Venice-inspired hub world, a windmill village, a commercial harbor, a beach, a chintzy theme park, a haunted hotel, an ancient bay, and a mountain village. Honestly, the aesthetic here really does the trick. As a kid, I always used to revisit Sunshine every summer, and it almost always felt like I was taking a vacation of sorts. Obviously, there's not as much visual variety here as there was in Super Mario 64, but Honestly, for one game, I don't really mind the more limited theming. I feel like they squeezed about as much out of the motif as they possibly could. And it's nice to see Mario not explore an ice field or a desert for once. The levels also contain exclusive mechanics and set pieces to stand out from each other. As for the enemies, I think this was another great change of pace. Goombas were replaced with these cute little lumps called Stroll and Stews, which look like Bert the Bashful from Yoshi's Island. Koopas in this game are either electrified or creepy eggshell monsters. Monsters. Bullet Bills have wacky googly eyes, bloopers have big floppy tentacles, pokies look like emojis, Monty Moles have little trucker outfits, and bob have LEDs for a face. So while most of the enemies have technically appeared in most other Mario games, they have wacky new designs that make Sunshine stand out. As a kid, these redesigns bothered me, but today it's one of my favorite things about this game. The unique art direction and visual aesthetic are a refreshing change of pace in an era where Mario games now repeat the same nostalgic cliches over and over again. While I think most would acknowledge Sunshine's great visuals, I feel like the soundtrack has unfortunately gone under the radar. As great as 64 soundtrack was, it kept reusing the same seven tracks over and over again across the 15 levels. Sunshine, on the other hand, has a dedicated musical track for each of the main stages as well as a few tracks for the side stages. Most stage themes are a remix of Essential Motif, but if Super Mario World can get away with that, then I don't see why Sunshine can't. All five of the boss themes are great, with the face-off against Mecha Bowser being a standout. As always, a couple songs from the NES original return, with the remix used in Delfino Airstrip being my favorite rendition of the overused underground theme. Other highlights include the tracks playing in the casino, the Sandbird, and of course, Delfino Plaza. I wouldn't call it the best Mario soundtrack of all time, but I do think it's unfortunately overlooked. That said, let's move on to the gameplay. Being a sequel to Super Mario 64, Sunshine has a similar structure. Delfino's capital city, Delfino Plaza, acts as a hub world connecting stages together by magic M's, pipes, and cannons. The goal is to collect the island's shine sprites, which you earn for defeating bosses, collecting 8 red coins, finishing platforming sections, completing minigames, and accomplishing other objectives. In contrast to 64, there's a much bigger focus on collecting things, which we'll get into when we talk about the blue coins. For much of the game, the focus is still on exploring the stages and completing tasks, just like in Super Mario 64. The game has 7 main stages, each with 8 missions or episodes. In terms of stage count, Super Mario 64 definitely enjoys the advantage. 15 main stages in 64 was already on the short side, but Sunshine has less than half as many. Compared to other collectathons of the time, 7 stages is embarrassingly few. I'd understand if people consider this a serious flaw, but as for me, the content and design of these stages, as well as all the side stuff, more than makes up for these shortcomings. In my 64 review, I criticized both versions of the game for kicking Mario out of a stage every time he grabbed a power star. 
calling it antithetical to the game's open world nature and a blatant way of disguising the game's short length. Sunshine carries on that tradition, but it makes a few adjustments that makes this design choice enhance rather than detract from the experience. For one thing, each episode changes around the stage layout to correspond with each episode, implying a passage of time between shines. For another thing, each stage is given its own plot that progresses over the course of the eight episodes. Shadow Mario shows up and causes trouble, with Mario foiling him for the first six episodes. In the seventh episode, Shadow Mario himself appears, with Mario chasing him away from the stage. After that, the eighth episode shows a resolution of sorts, with life returning to normal for the residents. Some stages have more interesting plots than others, with Serena Beach and Noki Bay being highlights. Over the course of Serena Beach, you rescue a hotel from a phantom manta ray, clear out a ghost infestation, scrub off a beach, chase off Shadow Mario, and restore Hotel Delfino to its former four-star glory. Stages also contain memorable NPCs, like the hotel owner, the old Noki, and the lady who owns all the chain shops. This makes the stages in Super Mario Sunshine much more lively and memorable than any of the stages in the previous game. Bottom line, the splitting of stages into discrete episodes to tell an ongoing story was an original, smart idea, helping Sunshine to stand out from most games in the collectathon subgenre. As for how these stages are designed, Sunshine once again improves markedly over its predecessor. While most of Super Mario 64 stages worked perfectly with the collectathon gameplay, stages like Dire Dire Docks, Tick Tock Clock, and Tall Tall Mountain had overly linear level design, which, coupled with the forced re-entries, made them unnecessarily repetitive to fully complete. Super Mario Sunshine, on the other hand, applies the design philosophy behind something like Womp's Fortress to every stage in the game. From Bianco Hills to Pianta Village, every stage is open-ended, with seemingly countless ways to get from place to place provided you know the controls. Because of that, playing the main shines feels considerably less repetitive. If you were looking forward to playing some well-designed linear platforming sections, don't worry, Sunshine's got you covered too. Much like how Super Mario 64 saved its most linear level design for secret or Bowser stages, Sunshine relegates all of its linear level design to secret stages and the final dungeon. There are usually a couple of secret stages in each main stage, and they're among the highlights of Super Mario Sunshine's gameplay in my opinion. On your first visit to these stages, Shadow Mario will show up and take your flood away, forcing Mario to get through an obstacle course with only his wits and superhuman athletics. These stages are surprisingly challenging by 3D Mario standards and will push your platforming acumen to the max. Many other optional stages are accessible from Delfino Plaza to test your skills even further. Thus, Sunshine offers the best of both worlds, open-ended level design for collectathon missions and some of the best linear stages in the 3D series for folks looking for something more traditional, without repeating Super Mario 64's mistake of trying to mix them both together in the main stages. As for the bosses, it's a considerable improvement over Super Mario 64 as well. While there was a decent amount of them, 64's boss fights all fell victim to their sheer ease of defeat and overt repetition. You can only fight Big Boo or Big Bully so many times before it gets old. Unfortunately, Sunshine doesn't seem to have learned as much from that mistake as it really should have. Seeing as you fight five polluted piranhas, two Monty Mole cannons, two PD piranhas, and three Gooper bloopers, I can at least credit Sunshine with trying to make these bosses slightly harder in later fights, with polluted piranhas taking additional hits and spawning more mooks, or PD piranha flying around and throwing tornadoes in the second fight. This doesn't really make them that much harder, but it's a step in the right direction. Beyond that, however, Sunshine's bosses are better than 64's bosses in almost every way. First of all, all the boss battles are a hell of a lot more interesting, be it fending off a giant robot while riding a roller coaster, flipping over a giant angry wiggler, or playing slots with King Boo. Second, with the noted exception of polluted piranhas, even the easiest bosses require some semblance of strategy and pattern recognition to defeat, in stark contrast to almost every boss in Mario 64. Third, a few of the bosses are actually decently challenging. Every time you spray Phantom Manta, for example, he divides into two increasingly smaller parts, until a bunch of mini mantas are swarming all over the place. Finally, unlike Bowser's previous appearance, none of the bosses center on janky, unreliable mechanics. If you ask me, the increased challenge and creativity of the selection of boss battles vastly outweighs the blatant repetition in the early game, making the bosses much better in this game overall. By far the biggest improvement in Super Mario Sunshine over 64, however, is definitely the play control. While I'll still defend the analog control in 64 and the D-pad controls in the DS remake, I'll be blunt when I say that Super Mario Sunshine has the best movement, physics, and handling of any 3D Mario game.
game. Full stop, no holds barred, no questions asked. As much as I love Galaxy, Galaxy 2, and even 3D World, they don't even hold a candle to this level of precision, tightness, and just overall good game feel. Everything from Mario's running speed, to the more precise turning, to the more forgiving wall jump timing, to the more maneuverable jumps, to that whooshy sound it makes whenever Mario does a spin jump or side somersault, it's simply the perfection of 3D Mario platforming control. Sunshine also strikes a fine balance for new and repeat players by making the level design perfectly approachable for newbies while rewarding players who have mastered the controls with shortcuts and a sense of skill. I remember chasing after Shadow Mario as a kid and being amazed at all the cool stuff he could do and wishing I could do it too. Fast forward to 2017 and I've achieved a mastery of Mario's moveset that I could have only dreamed of a decade earlier. Super Mario Sunshine is one of those games where the simple act of running around and jumping is incredibly satisfying in itself. And I could never say the same about 64 or either of the Galaxy games. That said, there are a few blemishes. Compared to Mario 64's more 3D conducive swimming controls, Mario's swimming controls in this game feel not only oversimplified, but slower as well, which is ironic for a game set on a tropical island. Nevertheless, the swimming controls function. The other problem concerns the sections where you move around underwater with the hover nozzle. Whenever you use the hover nozzle, the game goes to a tank control scheme, ostensibly to prevent players from abusing the mechanic. Only problem is that these underwater sections use the same tank scheme, and the turning is too slow and it just doesn't feel as intuitive as it really should be. The good news is that you'll only be doing this for three shines, hardly a deal breaker. The big birth of control issues is, of course, the stupid mud bug. Ah, spoiler alert! If you've ever played the final dungeon in this game, I'm almost certain you remember this nonsense. It's only one very brief section, but it was the bane of my childhood. And even today, I'm still not sure how this even works. You're supposed to spray water in whichever angle to steer the boat, but it almost never goes in the direction you expect it to. With patience, the mud boat is perfectly playable, but that doesn't change the fact that it's just a janky shite section. Post a pizza roll on this web zone if you know how to steer the boat. Other than that, I have virtually no complaints about the controls. As for the camera, Mario Sunshine once again blows away past and future Mario titles. Super Mario 64 had a slow moving camera that got caught on everything and could only move in set increments. Galaxy 1 and 2, with the limited button layout of the Wii Remote and Nunchuck, was forced to bring back an improved rendition of this system with centering and preset angles. Later games remove camera control altogether and make it entirely automatic. Not only does Sunshine bring on the camera sensor, Entering feature from the Zelda games, but it's the only 3D game in the series to date to feature actual analog camera control, and it feels so good. I know some people prefer preset angles because they always work, but I'm gonna side with Nick and Aqua Magna when I say that having that extra degree of control can make a game that much more fun to play. I haven't even talked about Flood yet, which Mario uses to spray enemies, clear away Shadow Mario's magic paint, interact with objects, and even platform around. Sunshine takes advantage of analog triggers to a degree that very few games have. Tap it and Mario will let out a little burst of water. Hold down the R trigger slightly and Mario can spray slightly while running. Hold down the trigger all the way and Mario will stand in place while aiming. Press the Y button and Mario will go into first person mode for precision aiming. Hold down the L trigger and Mario will strafe back and forth which you can mix with the R trigger to aim. And that's not all. You can spin in place and spray to become a human sprinkler head. You can shoot at the ground, flop onto it and ride it as a makeshift slip and slide. You can do a backflip move to spray a blast of water and clear out a bunch of goo ball at once and so on. Much like the base platforming, mastering Flood's sheer versatility takes time and rewards repeat players with a sense of skill. While some may claim that Flood is just a dumb gimmick and nothing more, I highly disagree. While I don't think it's as big an issue as some would suggest, I would agree that the caps in Super Mario 64 didn't have the greatest use case or sense of integration. It spiced up the mechanics a little bit, but nothing more. Flood, on the other hand, is a true game changer for the 3D Mario formula and everything from the platforming to fighting enemies to taking on bosses is structured to reflect that. The 
Hover Nozzle is a significant improvement over Super Mario 64, providing a simple way to correct jumps in midair, platforming shortcuts, and training wheels for newer players. You can eventually unlock two additional nozzles in the hub world and main stages. Much like the caps in 64, these don't have much utility beyond what they're required for, but I'd still say they're a little more useful on their own than the caps were. Overall, Flood feels useful and integrated for the entire 11 and a half hour adventure, and never comes off as just a forced or cheap gimmick. If you're looking for an extension to Mario's moveset, then look no further. Before I forget, Yoshi's actually in this game too, making his 3D Mario debut and completing the Super Mario World parallel. After you clear a certain shine, he'll become available in every level. Upon bringing him his favorite fruit, Yoshi will hatch and Mario can mount him. Yoshi can do everything Mario can do, but he's slightly faster, jumps higher, can flutter in midair, can destroy certain obstacles, and can eat enemies and objects. While he can be useful for collecting 100 coin shines and quickly eating blue coin birds, Yoshi is again mostly useful for the stuff for which he's required. He also dies if he gets into deep water, for some reason. Still, it's nice to see him back, and retrieving him in some cases can at least serve as a decent puzzle of sorts. With all that covered, it's time to talk about 100% completion. Back in 2015, my brother and I did a 120 shine playthrough of Super Mario Sunshine and Game Mavericks, and it's one of the best playthroughs we've ever done. We need the bananas. The bananas should be somewhere over here. <laughs> Where are the bananas? Michael, tell me. Where'd you hide the bananas? Michael, tell me where the bananas are. I have your family. <laughs> I have one member of them. If there aren't any bananas here, it'll be your head. <laughs> I are don't know where the damn bananas are, okay? Tell me where the bananas are. Where's Rachel? He's giggling over here. He thinks <laughs> what he said was funny. He just threw a fucking goldfish at me. <laughs> That is amazing. It was right here the whole time. <laughs> More to the point, we got a couple comments implying that Sunshine is apparently a super difficult or tedious game to 100%. And that seems to be the common opinion ever since this game came out, as far as I can gather. Evidently, there's just way too much stuff to grab. And don't worry, we'll get to the whole postcard thing in due time. As of writing, I fully completed Super Mario Sunshine a good seven or eight times, twice for this review. And I've gotta say, it's nowhere near as difficult as people make it out to be. Certainly, there are games where completionist runs are easier, but games like Banjo-Tooie have way more stuff to grab, and games like Spyro A Hero's Tale are significantly more frustrating and exhausting. While I would agree that Super Mario Sunshine is overall more challenging than 64, it's not by too, too much. And whenever things become more trial and error, there are checkpoints to back it up. Second, the challenge is overall well designed and generally not based on cheap or frustrating game design. The only thing preventing you from popping all the balloons within the time limit is your own level of skill. You're given plenty of time and the controls are perfectly functional. While the secret stage in Noki Bay is actually pretty difficult and may be a little too much to redo if you fuck it up, it's a far cry from the god-awful level design of Super Mario 64 Star Road. Also, as long as I'm on the subject, the secret of the village underside is nowhere near as terrible as some people make it out to be. You simply talk to the Piantas from the proper angle, and Bob's your uncle. Certainly, there are a couple shines that can be a mite tedious. Trying to get this giant watermelon through this field of cataquacks, for example, is an exercise in patience. When one fails in Super Mario Sunshine, though, in almost every case, blame rests with the player rather than the game's design. 100 coin shines return from Super Mario 64, and since the levels change so much between shines, you've got to be more careful about which episode you pick when you're going after these things. Like 64, there's also times where once you enter a sub area, you're not allowed to go back, but Sunshine makes this fact much more obvious. Also, by the time you'd be collecting these things, you'd likely have cleared all eight episode shines and know the levels pretty well. You'd know, for example, that if you want to get 100 coins in Serena Beach, you should probably pick a shine where you can go to the beach, the hotel lobby, and the casino in one run. While I'd say 100 coin shines take a little longer than in Super Mario 64 overall, you only have to get about half as many, and some are really easy. In Penis Park, you can get 100 coins in two minutes by just spraying the beach and killing the flying stews. Also, thanks to the absence of bottomless pits, it's also way harder to die and have to redo them from scratch. Thus, I'd say the 100 coin shines are inoffensive at their worst. I should mention that Sunshine has two secret shines per stage in addition to the eight episode shines and 100 coin shines, making for a total of 11 shines per stage. I wouldn't be surprised if these exist as filler to make up for the five cut levels, but I still think they're passable at worst. Most of them are second 
second rounds in the secret stages. This time you got flood and you're also trying to collect all the red coins within the time limit. While this is technically filler, what you're doing in these stages is substantially different from what you did the first time, so it gets a pass in my book. I just wish I didn't have to redo all the build up to the secret of the casino though, because that just takes a while. The rest of the secret shines are just randomly hidden in the stage, which makes them kind of boring to nab on repeat playthroughs, but not cumbersome. By the way, there is an in-game hint telling you how to get the Pianta Village secret shine, so it's not like it's super obscure or anything. There are only two shines in the game that I'd say are poorly designed and unnecessarily frustrating. The Pachinko Machine is quite infamous, and for good reason. The level seems to be based much more on luck than it is on skill, and when you die, it never feels like your fault. Still, at worst, it's tolerable. Much less tolerable is the Poison River. Honestly, it's not the stage itself so much as it is getting to it. You have to waste what feels like 10 minutes slowly riding these boats to carry Yoshi to this island so you can clear off this zigzag and enter the pipe. Again, Yoshi dies if you fall in the water. As long as you're patient and not overzealous, however, you should do it easily on your first try. The design of the stage itself isn't great either. You have to get all eight of these red coins in one perfect run over instant kill poison water, and it's basically just trial and error. But to be honest, it's really nothing you shouldn't conquer in a few tries. No. The real issue is one of the biggest Kaizo traps in gaming. If you're naive enough to jump in this pipe at the end, thinking it'll take you back to the start, you get booted out of the stage so you can waste another 10 minutes riding the fucking boats again. I think it's safe to say that almost everyone who plays the stage falls for this. Were the game designers afraid that people would forget how to pause and exit the stage manually? Why is this here? So yeah, the Poison River sucks. But again, that's only two shines out of 96? Hardly the deal breaker some folks make them out to be. Overall, I think people have severely exaggerated the tedium and frustration as far as shine sprites go. Now we move on to blue coins, a controversial inclusion to say the least. Each of the seven main stages contains 30 of these, while Delfina Plaza contains 20 and Corona Mountain contains 10, making for 240 blue coins in total. For every 10 you collect, you can bring them to this raccoon and trade them in for a shine sprite. Hold on a minute, Mario gets arrested for supposedly disturbing the shine sprites, but Monkey D. Cooper here gets to sell pilfered shines in the open market with no consequence? Regardless, that means 24 additional shines derived from the blue coins, so yes, they are required for 100% completion. The popular opinion, as I understand it, is that blue coins are bad because there are a lot of them and a significant portion of them are evidently obscure or otherwise difficult to find and keep track of. Additionally, some coins can only be retrieved in certain episodes for one reason or another, and some people would suggest that a substantial portion of blue coins fall under this category. Frankly, I think it's difficult to overstate how much people dislike this side quest, because I don't think I've ever heard a positive opinion of them as of writing this review. Before I offer my own opinion on the matter, I'd like to share some observations I made from having examined the blue coins in this game. I was curious as to whether the preceding claims about blue coins held any empirical value, so I opened up Strategy Wiki's Blue Coin Guide, which describes the coin's location and available episodes, and coded each and every one of the game's 240 blue coins for obscurity and exclusivity. I was specifically interested in answering two questions. First, how many blue coins are obscure? I coded the coin as zero if it's out in the open and all you have to do is find it and pick it up, a one if the coin requires you to kill a conspicuous enemy or solve an obvious puzzle to collect, and a two if it is truly obscure, requiring the player to perform an action that isn't readily apparent based on the environment. I also counted M's and enemies that were hidden in places that you'd never think to look. I tried to be really generous with that last category to err on the side of overestimating the number of obscure coins to correct for my own subjectivity. Second, how many blue coins are collectible from episode 8 when everything is theoretically unlocked? In case you didn't know, it is true that not all the blue coins will be available in stages from the get-go. I coded every coin you can collect in episode 8 a 0 and coins that are only available in other episodes a 1. I collected all the data on the spreadsheet and analyzed it in SPSS. Here are the results in chart form. Regarding the question of obscurity, 33.75% of coins are out in the open, 50.83% of coins require you to kill a conspicuous enemy or solve a simple puzzle, and only 15.42% are not readily apparent from the environment. Based on these results, I think it's safe to say that the overwhelming majority of blue coins are not in fact obscure. Most of them are either out in the open or behind an obvious puzzle. Now, I should stress that 37 coins, that 
that's 15.42% of 240 isn't exactly a small number. In fact, it's a much larger number than I expected. But again, this is the maximum possible number of coins that could be considered obscure. And really, obscurity is going to boil down to the individual player. Do you think shooting down this bee's nest and eating the bees with Yoshi is obscure? Personally, I just always thought to try that, but I know not everyone will. Of course, there are coins like ground pounding on a statue's nose that are definitely obscure, but as the data shows, these are few and far between. Either way, you can find the vast majority of these obscure blue coins by following one simple rule. If something looks suspicious or out of place, spray it. No really, it's that simple. And let's be honest, is it really the end of the world if you have to look up a few blue coins for a level? As for the other claim that a substantial portion of coins are episode exclusive, the data once again does not support this conclusion. You can collect 84.17% of blue coins in this game by simply visiting the 8th episode of each stage. The 15.83% of coins that are episode specific are generally pretty obvious. Most players will figure out that NPCs sometimes reward you with stuff for cleaning them off, so you'll probably grab the 8 blue coins and piantas in need no problem. The 4 blue coins in the sandburst stage, which is a required Required shine sprite, by the way, are right on the beaten path, so you can't possibly miss them. Also, if there's an episode where you go to a specific area, like the casino, I think the rational player would think to double check there for blue coins. Bottom line, based on these examinations, neither of the claims that people make about blue coins bear out empirically. That being said, blue coins are actually my absolute favorite part of Super Mario Sunshine. No, I'm not kidding, I'm not just saying this to be a contrarian, that is my honest, sincere opinion. As I established in my previous review, I'm a huge fan of collectathon games, be it Banjo, Spyro, and even Jack 1. Yeah, my opinion on that game's changed a lot. Whatever, moving on. In regards to blue coins, I see them as no different from gems in Spyro or precursor orbs in Jack 1. These are finite collectibles that reward players for exploring stages and interacting with the game environment in ways you wouldn't in a minimalist playthrough. I enjoy collecting blue coins for the same reason I enjoy collecting gems and orbs. It packs Sunshine's levels to the seams with interactivity and exploration value. Every nook and cranny could house a potential secret. While it can be kind of annoying to find some of these on your first 100% run, on repeat playthroughs it's fun to see how quickly you can grab them all based on memory alone. Honestly, it reminds me a lot of 100% speedrunning Metroid games, and let's not forget, some of those games have obscure pickups too. I've already cast doubt in the popular claims people make about blue coins, but I feel I feel like part of the reason people hate these things so much is that they save them all for the end of the game after they've collected all the other shines. My preferred method is to collect the coins as I'm going through the 8 episode shines. This speeds up the process significantly and gives you better insurance that you won't miss an episode exclusive coin. If you do it this way, you can grab all 30 blue coins in a stage as well as the 8 episode shines in about an hour and a half. You might have to come back with Yoshi to get some of the coins from earlier stages, but because you unlock Penis Park so quickly, you can easily unlock Yoshi very early on. I'd also like to remind the folks at home that Sunshine tracks your blue coin tallies in the map screen. And again, it's hardly a deal breaker if you have to look up a few coins to finish off the stage. Even I, with all my experience, have to look some up on occasion. Also, because these stages are relatively compact, there's only so many places you can look. It's not like trying to find, oh, I don't know, 120 shrines in one of the largest open worlds ever put on game media. Bottom line, I just don't understand understand why this side quest is so notorious. If you want to talk obscurity, tedium, and arbitrary bullshit, then I think the gem side quest in Crash Bandicoot are far greater offenders. Beyond all of that, however, the biggest complaint people have about fully completing Sunshine is that you don't get a good reward for doing so. It's common knowledge at this point that collecting all 120 shines gets you a postcard of all the game's characters in Casino Delfino. What people seem to forget is that getting 100% also unlocks an alternate costume. Talking to this Pianta talk a shine sprite shirt that you can wear while we're visiting the game's main stages. The problem with this is that by this point, you've already done everything in the game anyway. Then again, the same could be said about the reward in Super Mario 64, which I didn't even mention in the previous review. Yoshi maxes out your lives counter, and you can also unlock an extra move by doing a triple jump. That's nice, but 
<laughs> you've already finished the game, so it's pointless. In the DS version, you unlock the final minigame, which is at least something new. The reason I didn't discuss the rewards in the previous video is because I don't fully complete these games for the reward. Fact is, it's not just Super Mario Sunshine that's at fault here. The entire collectathon subgenre is kind of notoriously poor when it comes to providing extrinsic rewards for 100% completion. Sure, many will give you a secret final level, but you'll almost never get an extra reward worth a damn for completing that. Even the permanent Super Flame upgrade in Spyro 2, which many laud as a great reward, is equally as pointless as the Shine Sprite shirt unless if you decide to go after skill points. Much like how virtually all Sonic games contain at least some sloppy design elements, it's something you just kind of have to come to grips with if you're gonna play these games. And you know what? The lack of extrinsic rewards doesn't really bother me, because of a little something called intrinsic rewards. The enjoyment you get from doing something in itself. After all, isn't that why we play video games? To have fun? Fetch quests and RPGs are boring filler and have no intrinsic enjoyment, so the only thing that makes them worthwhile is the extrinsic reward. Doing missions in Super Mario Sunshine is fun on its own merits, so I don't need an extrinsic reward to make it worth doing. That's why I'm willing to find all the exits in Super Mario World even though the only reward you get is a pallet swap, because Super Mario World is a fun game, and I want to get the most bang for my buck. It's the same thing here. I've 100 percent in Super Mario Sunshine eight times because I think this game is fun as hell, and I'm willing to tolerate the Poison River and the Pachinko Machine in a few obscure blue coins precisely because I'm having so much fun. Even if you disagree and prefer a minimalist run, then I still think Super Mario Sunshine has you covered. All that's necessary to finish the game is completing the first seven episode shines in each stage. If you want, you can beat the game at 51 shines without ever collecting 100 coins or secret shines or any of the blue coins. Some people may complain that having to fight Shadow Mario in every stage to fight the final boss makes the game inflexible, but given the narrative progression of each stage, it makes perfect sense from a story perspective and it's not like any of the preceding shines are that much of a chore to play, and I think that pretty much leads me into my conclusion. I absolutely love Super Mario Sunshine to death. Like Sonic Colors, this is one of those rare games that only seems to get better every time I play it. On its own merits, it's got great level design, a fun goofy story, excellent graphics for the time that still hold up today, an underrated soundtrack, and the best control and camera of any 3D Mario game to date. As a GameCube sequel to Super Mario 64, it improves on almost everything. From my point of view, the graphics are better, the soundtrack is better, the controls are better, the bosses are better, the open-ended levels are better, the linear levels are better, the optional content is better, power-ups are better, and frankly, I just find myself wanting to replay it a lot more often. That being said, I do think Super Mario 64 DS in particular has more content and less filler, and Sunshine's stage count and filler shines betray the game's rushed development cycle. At least one person will argue that Sunshine is inferior to 64 anyway because it isn't as classic or revolutionary. As I said in my Donkey Kong Country review, and as I'll be saying again when I review Super Mario Galaxy 2, games should be judged based on their design, not based on whether people found them impressive 20 years ago. What was impressive 20 years ago may not be impressive today. As this thorough examination of Super Mario Sunshine shows, this game is competently designed with amazing controls and great level design, and it outperforms Super Mario 64 on numerous measures. Because of that, I think I can say confidently that Super Mario Sunshine is a sizable improvement over Mario 64. Now, that said, Super Mario Sunshine won't appeal to everyone and is definitely not beyond criticism. While I think Sunshine's emphasis on missions makes it relatively accessible, I still recognize that the collectathon genre is one that most people either love or hate. Additionally, Super Mario Sunshine has its share of filler, no doubt to make up for the loss of five planned levels during the game's short development. While I personally don't mind that too much, I would totally understand if people found this game boring or repetitive in certain parts. There are also a couple of missions in the game that are decisively poorly designed. I'd also like to state that if you do dislike this game for whatever reason, I think that's perfectly reasonable and will respect your opinion. Despite its flaws, however, I opine that Sunshine is a great 
great game and holds up where it really matters. In fact, not only do I think Super Mario Sunshine holds up, I think it's one of those rare games that's gotten better with time. Ever since 2005, the entire Mario franchise from the main series games to the spin-offs has become increasingly reliant on nostalgia and reusing the same level tropes over and over and over again. While I don't mind this as much as most people, and while some games have given an honest stab at trying to be more original, at this point the nostalgia pandering is just getting old. And that's precisely what makes this game even better in 2017 than it's ever been before. In an era where Every Mario game from Mario Party to Mario & Luigi has to look the same and play the same. It's so refreshing to play a game where the gameplay is distinct, the standard level tropes are omitted, and the enemies look and behave differently. That's why I'd like to put forth my support for the hypothetical Super Mario Sunshine HD that fans of this game have been asking about for years. Now, of course, if we really want to play Super Mario Sunshine in HD, Dolphin is a perfectly serviceable option. That said, the current HD texture pack is incomplete and has a few ugly assets, and the widescreen and frame rate hacks all have some kind of weird quirk that makes them less than completely satisfactory. And all that's assuming you have a computer that's powerful enough to run Dolphin to begin with. That, and I feel like a proper remake from Nintendo themselves could be so much more than a mere HD facelift. Just imagine how great Super Mario Sunshine would be if they gave it the Super Mario 64 DS treatment for the Switch. Not only would the portability on the Switch be a plus for many people, but it would be a great opportunity to reintroduce the cut content that was abandoned during development. Imagine a version of Super Mario Sunshine that had the five levels that were cut during development, that provided more detailed accounting for blue coins, where you could choose to play as Luigi with altered physics, or where you could unlock a variety of outfits from the sunglasses Pianta after collecting a certain amount of blue coins. There's so much potential for a Super Mario Sunshine HD, and if it gives Nintendo an opportunity to reassess how formulaic Mario has gotten over the past six years, even better. And you know what? I think it just might be a possibility with Miyamoto foregoing much of his creative control for the upcoming Super Mario Odyssey, it's shaping up to be the most creative and experimental Mario title since Super Mario Sunshine. It's the Mario game I've been clamoring for ever since Super Mario Galaxy debuted in 2007. Whether Sunshine HD will happen remains to be seen, but for now, I'd say there's hope. Well shit, that took a hell of a lot longer than I thought it was going to. But fuck it, I only get one chance to review this game and I sure as hell wasn't going to waste it, so no apologies. Next video will hopefully be more reasonable, but you know, I never know until I really sit down and start scripting, but yeah. Um, I do want to do Super Mario Galaxy 1 and 2 eventually, but not now. Creatively, I need a new project to work on, because over the past few years it's always been, I want to do this. I record footage three months in advance. Three months later, I sit down to actually write the script, and I don't care about the project anymore. I push through, and it's, yeah. I need something new to just sit down and fucking work on, so that's what's coming next. And we're going to be going back to Remake or Rebreak, and as I've been teasing in the update videos, I want to do a marathon on remakes that are decisively not so great, because most of the stuff I look at on this channel is pretty competent. And I think that's fair to say. And there are a lot of remakes and replaces on this on that segment. So let's look at some more remes and rebreaks, possibly. Uh, more mediocre stuff. Yeah, we'll come into them with an open mind, but stuff that I will expect will not be quite as good. So yeah, I can't confirm or deny what those games will be, but um, if you've been watching the update videos, you'll probably have a pretty good idea of what I want to do next. Um, so until then. I'm X of Paradigm Gamer, and I hope you all enjoyed the review.